Welcome back to uh, another lesson in the chronological life of Jesus and we're looking at uh, the Samaritan woman and Jesus' encounter at the second session. So we're looking at the first year and a half of Jesus' ministry, the year of preparation and uh, <clears throat> we see the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. We looked at the introduction last week and we're continuing uh, the study this week on Jesus' continued relationship with this woman. Verse 11 says, You have no bucket, sir, she answered. The well is deep. How do you get this living water? Are you a greater man than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself with his sons and his cattle? Jesus replied, Whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again, but no one who drinks the water that I shall give will ever be thirsty again. The water that I shall give will become a spring of water within, welling up for eternal life. Sir, said the woman, give me some of that water, so that I may never be thirsty or come here again to draw water. Go and call your husband, Jesus said to her, and come back here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right to say I have no husband. For though you had five, the one you now have is not your husband. You spoke the truth there. I see you're a prophet, sir, said the woman. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, though you say that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation comes from the Jews. But the hour is coming indeed is already here when true worshippers will worship the, fa the Father in spirit and in truth. That is the kind of worship the Father seeks. God is spirit and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah, that is Christ, is coming and when he comes he will explain everything. Jesus said, that is who I am, I who speak to you. So we see this entering into the journey to Galilee during the Judean ministry and we're working through this situation. In our last lesson we looked a little at the history of Samaria and the Samaritans. We saw Jesus meeting the woman by the well and Jesus asked her for water. The conversation moved from the physical water to the spiritual water that Jesus was able to give. John 4.10 says, Come to me and drink. Jesus is the living water from which spiritually thirsty men must drink in order to live. We saw that one must immediately come to Jesus. Those who would drink of the living water must take the initiative to act in their belief that they can drink of that water. Remember in John 3.16, God gave his Son. So the gift of God is Jesus, and the salvation he has to offer to save mankind is from their sins. Remember what verse 10 says, <clears throat> If only you knew the gift of God and who it is that says you give me something to drink, you would ask me to give a drink of living water. 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be to God for his gift that is beyond all telling. The grace of God is demonstrated and the giving of Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that makes the opportunity of salvation available to all men. Had she known, she would have understood that though physically Jesus was the object of her charity in asking her for water, spiritually their cases were reversed, because she was the one who was in need. The phrase living water to people in those days meant water from a flowing stream as opposed to still water sitting at the bottom of a well. Jesus is using it to represent life-giving words from God, but the woman would not have understood this at first. Since Jesus had no container, she couldn't see how he could draw water from this well, let alone fetch living water. Could he actually be greater than the Samaritan's ancestor Jacob, who dug the well and used it for his family and his livestock? The 
though men totally misunderstands Jesus, he challenges him on physical grounds. The well is deep, not even comprehending the possibility of a spiritual element being included. The Samaritan woman, still thinking in physical terms, asks Jesus, ironically, if he is a proficient and a well digger as Jacob himself. Respect for the past prevents her from seeing the opportunity of the future. In response, Jesus launches into a discourse explaining all the joy and effervescence of a good, full spiritual life. The nearer we are to God, the greater should be our joy. Are you greater than Jacob? The answer that follows implies yes. By a question we learn that the Samaritans, though a mixed breed, view themselves as descendants of Jacob and were not above rubbing this into the Jews' face. After all, Jacob's well was in the possession of the Samaritans. The very water that once watered the Jews' ancestors has been used by the Samaritans. Josephus mentions that the Samaritans loved to claim Israelite ancestry, where the Jews were prospering and deny any connection with him when things were going badly. McGarvey notes at least three points in 4 verse 12. It says, first we see the greatness of Jesus. The woman had just called him Sir or Lord. The man at Bethsaida, though he knew not Jesus afterwards, did the same. People felt the majesty and the dignity of Jesus and the authority of Jesus. When Jesus offered to give a greater blessing than that could be given by Jacob, the woman at one contra once contrasted Jesus with Jacob. Jacob with his sons and his cattle and his wealth, she wondered if this lonely stranger could really imagine himself greater than the illustrious patriarch. She claimed descent from Jacob. It was a false claim. Jesus classed the Samaritans with the Gentiles, foreigners. Jesus spoke of them as strangers or aliens. Thirdly, she spoke of the well as given by Jacob. She meant it had been given to Joseph <coughs> when the blessings were done uh, way back in Genesis 48 and that her people had inherited it as descendants of Joseph. Jesus' immediate response identifies him at once as being greater than Jacob, but not only on a physical level. He is greater on a far more important spiritual level. Jesus replies that his water was better because those who drink of it never thirst again. The water will become a fountain of everlasting life flowing through them. When we drink in the word of God, is for our souls, and when we allow his word to dwell in our lives, it will spring up into everlasting life. Sometimes this idea of living water represents the receiving of the Holy Spirit. For example, in Acts 22, 38, where it talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in that verse. The idea that when a person became a Christian, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in him, live in him. Other times it's used to represent eternal life, in heaven, for example, Revelation 22.1. This was something that the woman could see as being valuable. With such water, she could stop having to come to draw water from this well, she thought. Yes, we have eternal life as Jesus becomes increasingly important to us. Our joy should really increase correspondingly. correspondingly. We have life, and we can have it in abundance. We ought to enjoy it, live it, share it. Man doesn't control the spring, it is from God, never-ending abundance for all simply to take. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and with me in him bears fruit in plenty. For cut off from me, you can do nothing. William says, never, no, never thirst again. Bubbling life which we drink of Jesus, we should become a bubbling well bringing conviction and contact with others. It's a beautiful finger of the joy in Christ, in heat, in cold, in drought, in shower, in prosperity and adversity. It still springs up, cheering and refreshing the soul, and this unto eternal life. The response of the Samaritan woman is likewise immediate, but it reflects that she was still thinking in purely physical terms. In fact, 
Her stated desire for such water was so that she wouldn't have to go through the daily toil of drawing water and taking it back to her village for her family and perhaps others. Indeed, many seek to follow Jesus for the physical rest which they perceive that he provides, rather than for the higher spiritual blessings which are provided solely in him. In a day and a time when many follow Jesus for the loaves and the fishes, Jesus desires followers who are themselves searching for a spiritual reality. The woman accepted Jesus' offer, though she didn't understand exactly what it was offering to her. She responds with a somewhat cheeky answer, Note, Sir, give me this water. Sir, cure, Lord, was a mark of respect. Next, Jesus forced her to look at herself. Verse 16 says, Go and call your husband, said Jesus to her. Come back here. Jesus reaches into the heart of this woman's needs. She lives an immoral lifestyle. Jesus tells her to call her husband knowing that she had none. Anna can mean husband or man, depending on the context. Notice how Jesus uses the same approach with Nicodemus. The first statement is most understood, so it tries again more vividly. Since Jesus was not able to get her to understand about the living water, Jesus used another approach to reach her with the truth. Jesus tries to awaken her conscience to bring her to the point of understanding and need for the water of salvation. Jesus asked her to fetch her husband. She must then confess her standards. As I said before, perhaps this immorality was why she was at the well at this time instead of coming down with the other women of the village in the cool of the morning or in the evening. Jesus seems abrupt in asking this question, and her answer is very honest. She could easily have lied. Jesus then complimented her on her forthrightness and her personal honesty. To Jesus' request, the woman admits she has no husband. Jesus points out the truth of her statement. She has been living in adultery, having had five husbands and not even bothering to marry the man with whom she is currently living. The five husbands could have been the result of a tragic row of deaths. She must either be very polygamous or a multiple divorce situation or the discussion has little point. There's something wrong. She is now living with a man in an unmarried situation. This was always indefensible. The rabbis of the day usually didn't allow more than three marriages. The loose divorce law of that age permitted a man to dissolve the marriage ties on very slight provocation. Conviction and evasion. The woman is now very attentive. She attempts to change the subject to one of religious worship, a theological question. And Jesus allows her to do this gracefully. Now light begins to dawn in the woman's mind. Here was a man who knew her past, though they had never met. She correctly concludes, he must be a prophet of God. By calling Jesus a prophet, she is acknowledging that what Jesus said was actually true. She had heard of the miraculous knowledge of the Jewish prophets, and this evidence given to her by Jesus persuaded her he must be one of them. This is like evidence that had been persuaded Nathaniel. Note there is now a reaction to Jesus' attack on her morals. Jesus is getting too close. She has to acknowledge him as a prophet and then changes the subject to take the spotlight off herself, perhaps. This is common with people today. When you highlight their lives in light of the gospel, they respond with, well, what about suffering in the world? We need to remind them they are either part of the problem or part of the cure. She declared him to be a prophet. As the Samaritans didn't accept any prophet after Moses, she must have had in mind the prophet, the Messiah, which both the Jews and the Samaritans were waiting for. Having access to a true prophet of God was a rare event, and perhaps she also wanted to turn the conversation away from her troubled life, so she asked about one of the points of contention between the Samaritans and the Jews. 
19.20 says, I see you are a prophet, says the woman. Our fathers worship on this mountain, though you say that Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Where must a person worship? Here or in Jerusalem? What is the true worship? As the Samaritan woman continued the transition from physical to heightened spiritual awareness, note the justification of worshipping on Mount Gerasim was because this is what their ancestors had always done, even though the law clearly stated that worship must be done in Jerusalem. Isn't that odd that today that's often the, what we encounter when we talk to people about Jesus and about perhaps recognising him as a different way to serve him, to worship him. People say, well, my, my, my father always did it this way. My mother always did it this way. My, my great-grandparents have always believed this and have always done it this way. Exactly. Human nature doesn't change that much, does it? She immediately broached the subject which is the centre of the religious controversy between Judea and Samaritan Jews. The location of the true temple, therefore, the exercise of true worship under God. She hoped for the coming of the Messiah. Much that Jesus said would be beyond her understanding, but she believed that some future time the problems would be solved. The difficult questions would be answered by the coming Messiah. Her sincerity, the reference to this mountain, Mount Gerasim, the centre of Samaritan worship. Barker said, she was saying to herself, I'm a sinner before God, I must make an offering for my sin. I must take an offering to the house of God and put myself right with him, where I'm going to take it. Where am I going to take it? The weakness of this suggestion is that no Samaritan could expect to be welcome at the temple in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, someone who Jesus dealt with experienced a waiting conscience and a desire to get right with God. A statement of a Samaritan woman is a matter-of-fact statement that seeks to offer no solution. Perhaps she was asking for clarification on the purpose of these religious controversies. From this man, she considered to be a prophet. Our fathers, the ancestors, she was claiming descendants from Abraham and Jacob, both of whom erected altars in this area. The Samaritans believed that Mount Gerasim was sacred because Abraham offered Isaac at the foot of Mount Gerasim on Mount Moriah, and they worshipped there. The ruins of the temple was there. This is where they held their Passover annually. You say the Jews, of course, didn't agree, believing that Mount Zion, where the temple was, was, was a real sacred place. So Jesus again speaks on terms of transition by stating, he said, shortly the question would no longer matter because there would be not one set place to worship God. Rather, worship would be acceptable wherever men and women have their hearts and their minds attuned to the obedience of God's will. Paraphrase. The time is coming when neither exclusively in Jerusalem nor exclusively at Mount Gerasim will man worship the Father. Jews today have a problem. The Old Testament law demands sacrifices for forgiveness. Then without sacrifices they cannot be acceptable to God. How do they view Jesus when there's no longer any temple? When there's no longer any sacrificial system, when they're almost like in a situation of limbo. John 4.22 provides Jesus' response to the concerns of a Samaritan woman regarding location and form of worship. Jesus appealed to an objective standard in this verse, should neither be overlooked nor minimised. Merely because the Samaritans were sincere and desired to begin a new religious movement, which reflected their own cultural differences, values and mores, were insufficient reasons to change the will of God. Jesus made it clear that God had specifically manifested his will through his word to the Jewish nation. False worship, misguided, misled worship. You worship that which you know nothing about. The Samaritans didn't accept the writings of the prophets or the Psalms or historical books. Theirs was a false worship based on incomplete revelation. It was ignorant worship. It was a fact of human nature that we often will only accept what is agreeable to us and reject what we don't like. <clears throat> Jeremiah 7.24 says, But they wouldn't listen. 
They kept on doing whatever they wanted to, following their own stubborn evil thoughts. They went backward instead of forward. The Samaritans have worshipped out of ignorance. The Jews had the truth of God's will. But the time has come when God seeks people who will worship him in both spirit and in truth, both from a fervent desire and a willingness to obey God's will. God is spirit, so proper worship is not merely a physical ritual. But it's from the heart, accompanied by obedience. Paul begins his book in Romans 1 verse 5, talking about the obedience of faith. And he finishes his book, it book ended, if you will, the whole book by 1626, Faithful Obedience. Salvation is from the Jews. Jesus referring to himself here. The bloodline of Jesus is simple proof that salvation is from the Jews and is found in Jesus, the only true law-abiding Jew. Paul in Romans 11 explains how God had not rejected Israel, but rather Israel had rejected God. Christians, composed of saved, both Jew and Gentile, are the new holy nation, the new Israel of God. It was through the physical Jewish nation that the Messiah, the Saviour of the world, came. It is in and through him that all God's promises and his eternal purpose have been fulfilled. The Israelites were once accepted as God's chosen people. They were rejected as a nation when they rejected Jesus but not completely rejected as a people, because those who trusted in Jesus and responded to the message of the gospel were accepted, as seen in Romans 11.1. 1. Paul seeks to show that God never rejected Israel completely at any time, because there was always a remnant of faithful Jews. The remnant now are those Israelites who have obeyed, have obeyed the gospel. Jesus pointed out to the Samaritan woman that this transition of worship was imminent. This verse emphasizes six characteristics of this imminence. Jesus referred to true worshippers as distinct from those who worship on their own terms, thinking that they know best. It's not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the person who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus says that true worshippers shall worship, denoting the imperativeness of worship. Jesus emphasizes the word worship, which refers to the prescribed action that one is to take in the formal homage and recognition of God as creator. One of the elemental truths of the Bible is that God desires to be worshipped in a prescribed manner. In the Old Testament, Exodus 25, 9, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle, the pattern of all the furniture thereof, make everything according to the pattern. In the New Testament, Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves, what to? To the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayers. Second Corinthians 2 verse 9, Paul says, I wrote for this reason, to test you, to know whether you are obedient in everything. Jesus informed us as to the proper object of worship. The Father, the Creator God, who is worthy of praise, who desires the praise of his children. Jesus next instructs us as to the attitude that we are to have in worship, for in that we are to worship in spirit. The spirit is dependent on the attitude and the condition and the intention of the heart inner attitude and outward act in harmony. Jesus places emphasis upon the importance of maintaining the correct doctrine or teaching in our worship when he pronounces we are to worship in truth, in truth, in harmony with the revealed will of God. This is God's will, not man's idea. God is looking for a particular type of worshipper. God is spirit. God is not human and physical like us, because God is invisible. You hear someone say, I can't believe in something, or someone I can't see. Ask him to look at the chair they're sitting on. Then ask them, was the chair made by someone, or did it just happen by an explosion in a wood? If you believe it was made by someone, but you cannot see them, 
that you can believe because the chat exists. We exist, and we are super complexly made. Each cell contains more information than 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Each cell. Therefore, we can understand and believe that there is a God. We know that somebody wrote the Encyclopedia Britannica. If there's information in a cell of exactly the same or similar volume, surely somebody must have written it. Even though the Bible describes God as having a face, ears, eyes and hands, these descriptions are given so we can relate to what have been said, uh, <coughs> human characteristics we can identify with. Jesus makes it clear that spirit doesn't have flesh and bone like we do. This is also an excellent scripture that refutes the Mormon doctrine that teaches God is flesh and bones. God is spirit shows that God is absolutely free from all limitations of space and time and is therefore not to be localized in temples. God is not material as idolaters contend. God is not an abstract force as scientists think. He is a being. God is left above all needs of temples and sacrifices that are a benefit to man. They are of benefit to man, but they're not a benefit to God ultimately. The emphasis has moved from the formal type of temple worship to the new type. His worshippers must now worship in spirit and in truth. We have to not only have the right attitude, but the right information. Worship must be done from our hearts and with our understanding. Some are all spirit and little truth. Others are all truth but very little spirit. Therefore a true worshipper when praying and singing praise unto the Lord will do so with understanding. Frank Morgan used to say that the Jehovah's Witnesses have plenty of fire, but got nothing to burn. He then went on to say that we have plenty to burn, but we lack the fire. When a true worshipper gives to the Lord of his, his or her financial means, it needs to be done with correct attitude as well in the prescribed manner. Likewise, when a true worshipper partakes of the Lord's Supper, he or she will do so with the proper attitude and the proper manner. The Lord re-emphasized in this verse the principles concerning, uh, contained in John 4.23. Thus we may not alter the prescribed form of worship, but must adhere to his truth, his teaching, his doctrine. Nor may we worship in, in any manner or attitude that we choose. Only by means of this worship behavior can we please God and be truly edified ourselves. Such a dramatic change the woman understood would come about when the Messiah came from God. Jesus plainly tells us he is the Messiah. Christos, anointed one. This Hebrew term only found here in John 1 41. The Samaritans were looking for the Messiah. But yet this is the first record of Jesus stating who he was and made not to lead leading Jewish men, but to a sinful Samaritan woman. The next time Jesus confessed to be Messiah is by Simon Peter in Matthew 16, 16. That was in the last year of Jesus' ministry. He has said this to a Samaritan woman at the beginning of his Judean ministry. Jesus spoke more freely as to his office in Samaria than in Judea or Galilee, for the Samaritans wouldn't try to make him take him by force and make him a king as others did in John 6.15. Jesus' short stay in Samaria justified this explicit and brief revelation. I who speak am he. This first time in John where Jesus indicates his deity by using the I am phrase that was later to anger the Jews. I am. Egreme. If Jesus is not deity, then this claim it surely blasphemy. These verses stand in stark contrast to the pronouncements of many false religious teachers who ignorantly affirm that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. If you've managed to get something out of this study, please feel free to come back and join us once more. Every blessing.